The courage of conviction. The, do you have the courage to stand for Jesus Christ, to follow him all these songs this morning? Follow him all, all the way. To, to, to be there, regardless of what other people do. Uh, just tells right in our Sunday school lesson perfectly from this morning when, when the Hebrew children had to make a decision. Would they fall down and worship an idol? Or will they be thrown into the fiery furnace and die? Because they have no hope of living. Said that they knew their God could, but either way, they were going to serve God and not man. They did that because they had faith in God. The Apostle Paul is, is going to show his conviction of courage this morning. And uh, here, here's a question. I, I wrote this down. Conviction to live holy in today's climate and culture is very needed. I don't think that. I, I think that's true of every generation. I, in fact, I suppose that 28 years I've been here, at least it'll be 28 years in, this, in a few weeks, uh, any Sunday morning, I could have said that's a good question. Uh, very much a need. Conviction to live holy in today's climate and culture is needed. Will you, don't look at your wife, don't look at your friend, don't look behind you, in front of you, will you exhibit the courage to live out God's convictions in your life? Paul has made up his mind that he will do that. Paul was into his third missionary journey. I'm going to back up a little bit for review to to, to give you an idea of what's happening. He's in his third missionary journey. He wanted to get to Jerusalem for Passover. He couldn't remember things. Some things happened. They plotted to kill him on the pilgrim ship. So he waits then to, to Pentecost. So several months later, he wants to get there to take that big offering, tens of thousands of dollars that they're taking up to the Jerusalem church. He has seven or eight pastors from the Gentile churches traveling with him. They're actually taking the offering to give to James and the church elders in Jerusalem. And all along the way, I'm going back one chapter, chapter 20, verse 22, Paul says, And now, behold, I go bound by the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, except that, in that, that the Holy Ghost, that's not somebody saying this, the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. They wait for me there. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. So that I might, here's our title from last week, might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of peace. Grace, I mean, excuse me, the gospel of grace. I just read that word. The gospel of grace of God. To preach the grace of God. That's my desire. And then he warned the Ephesian elders and said, For I know, verse 29, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. But remember to the elders, verse 28, take heed therefore for yourself. Grow up yourself. Mind yourself. And then the flock of God, which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, pastors, uh, actually the word is bishops, overseers, as the King James translates, to feed the church of God. I love, this is so apparent. Which he hath purchased with his own blood. It's not Paul's church. It's not the elder's church. It's not these pastors are traveling with me. It's not the Timothy's church or, or Tych, uh, Tychus or any of these other. It's the church that God purchased with the blood of his son. Amen. That's the church that he says you are to feed to take care of. So, so now, of course, he's traveled many more weeks, or excuse me, days after that since he left the, the elders at, uh, of Ephesus there on the, on the short Miletus. They prayed for him. Now he's in Philip's house. Chapter 21, verse 8. And the next day, they that were we, that were Paul's company, Luke is with the group, it's a personal pronoun, we, Dr. Luke, writing the book of Acts, we, that were Paul's company, departed, came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Philip was one of the seven, way back early in the book of Acts. And because of the persecution of Saul of Tarshish, we call him what? Paul the Apostle. 
He has been scattered, and now for over 20 years he's lived not in Jerusalem, but in Caesarea, the Roman city, and he has preached the word there, and he's called the evangelist. Now, now listen to this. There are many evangelists. The evangelist is one of the gifts that God gives to the church. Uh, let me read this to you from the book of Ephesians. And God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers. Why? Why did God give these men to the church? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Wow. Now, so here's these gifts that God has given to the church. Apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers. But then he says, what, back, go back one page. He says this. Now, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Two of these gifts that he gives to the church are foundational gifts. Apostles and prophets. Now, today we have evangelists still yet. We have pastor teachers still yet. But we don't have apostles and prophets anymore. Okay, so, so they're the foundational gifts that, that God. But let me finish reading that verse. I built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus is what we're built on. <coughs> then they didn't have a New Testament yet. All they had was the Old Testament. Some books are already been written by this time. The book of James has been written, First Corinthians. But they haven't got together. They're just going out to, to these different churches and stuff. And so there are men, and you believe this, that actually stood with no New Testament. And they're preaching from Isaiah, and all of a sudden, they start saying stuff that we would say in the book of Romans. They start, uh, they start, these prophets have visions from God, and they start preaching how Jesus Christ has set up the church, a whole new thing, a whole new thing. Uh, no longer is the nation of Israel the way to Jesus, the, the way to heaven, but now the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, through his blood, has purchased the church, Jews and Gentiles. These prophets and apostles are saying this. And so, uh, so Philip was one of those guys, though. He's one of the evangelists. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet. By the way, he's the only prophet that's named in the New Testament. But we know there's many prophets, like we know there are many evangelists. God didn't just give one evangelist to the church. Philip's the only one that's called Philip the evangelist, but scattered throughout the church in the first century. And, and, and today, right now, 2020, there are evangelists. There are men that's been called to do that. They're pastor teachers. Uh, here's the only prophet that we know. Even though Paul said, I prophesy, but Paul was an apostle. He, God would use, like God used Bill four dollars to prophesy. By the way, now I know not everyone would agree with me, but you can have your own opinion, okay? You don't have to, I, I preach the word of God and the you read the Word of God for yourself. Study the Word of God. I believe the gifts of God are still available. I believe that they're still the gift of prophecy, but there are no prophets. There are no office, office of the prophets. I believe that 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 that, that there's still a gift of healing. You know, I, I believe the spiritual gifts are available for us. Just like Phil's daughters, they would prophesy, but they were not prophets, the only the prophet we read about here. So this great man of God comes named Agabus, and we met him oh my goodness, 20 years before this, when he came to Caesarea where Paul and, and Barnabas were pastoring, along with several other men who raised a great big long list of men that were pastoring there. And he said, there's going to be a great drought in a few years. Can you imagine just speaking the word of God like this? this is, Agabus is this. Yeah, so, so here comes a certain prophet named Agabus, And when he was coming to us, again, Luke is there with them, he took Paul's girdle. Now, Paul wasn't trying to die or something. He wasn't wearing a girdle like that. A girdle means his long sash that would go around his, his the tie when you walk your back would hurt so you tie. So go around it three or four, four times, a big sash, pull it together, okay? Remember what it talks about uh, uh, Elijah tucking his garment in his girdle. So he could take off running so he wouldn't trip. Remember that? And he outruns two 
two more solid statements. <laughs> God would just let these men do marvelous athletic things. And there was this chariot pulled by two horses, and Elijah out and runs it for several miles. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. But anyhow, so the, he takes Paul's girdle and bound his own hands. Agabus binds his own hands and feet, so it's a very long piece of cloth. Thus saith the Holy Ghost, God himself is speaking. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, and shall deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and even and they of the place, uh, Philip and his daughters and other believers there in Caesarea, besought him. The word that means to beg, to come beside him. It's uh, not used very often in the entire Bible. We besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning asking that you bless your word this morning. That you'd open up our hearts and that as in a Sunday school class, that we would be challenged to be people of conviction, to be people of courage. I don't know what each of us, you do, will face today, tomorrow, this week if you tarry as you're coming and what which of us you want to face. I know some of our churches are facing things I cannot even imagine. Yet you're giving them courage day by day. Week by week you're giving them courage that they that they may have not even known they had a year ago. Lord God, give us courage. Give us conviction. Then give us the courage to stand by our conviction to, to do what you would have us to do. As we look at this passage of scripture this morning, long passage of scripture that we'll just read through. There are many good lessons. Maybe you're already speaking lessons to some people sitting here that, that, that never come to my mind, but the Holy Ghost is speaking to them today as we look into your word. Let us leave here today since being good to be in God's house. We've been encouraged. We've been lifted up. Then if there's any of us that need to pray today, for God to come up to the altar and pray. Those that are believers, come up and just pray and talk to you and renew the joy of their salvation. If there's any that doesn't know Christ the Savior, maybe they're a member of this church, but they don't know Christ the Savior today. It could be their day. Maybe they're one of our deacons. I don't know God. Maybe my own wife. I don't know what you have, Lord. I pray that you speak to us and we will leave here today saying, I'm glad I was in God's house today. Corporate worship and lift and to worship together. Father, we thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. Jesus' name, amen. amen. The courage of conviction. The courage of conviction. All right, so let's just start here and we'll outline. Now, there's a prophet that instructs him. Every city he's been coming to along the way, people have been warning Paul, but then they have been saying, don't go, Paul. Did you notice that Agabus did not tell him not to go? Agabus is a seasoned prophet. I love the apostle Paul. This has already been written. He's already written 1 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul said, Now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now, God's prophecy was true, but just like the gift of prophecy will be in you today. Maybe God speaks to someone there. Maybe a gift of prophecy fell on you, and you have a prophecy. Well, you've got to make sure you sell it to say the prophecy and don't try to add a whole lot into it, okay? So these other people were, were seeing that Paul was going to be back. Then there's, don't go, Paul, don't go, Paul. Please don't go, Paul. Please don't go. That's not God's will. God's will is for Paul to go. Their job was to warn him what would happen to him when he gets there. He is bound by the Spirit to go. We read that before we preached last week. He was bound by the Spirit to go. But God wants him to be fully aware that when he gets there, He's going to be in trouble. Bad things are going to happen to him when he gets there. What do you say? None of these things will be. But now a prophet himself is speaking to him. So let's just go and buy this verse by this. So Philip has these, Philip is forgiven, Paul, because it says they stayed many days. You're wondering how long that would be. It would mean it'd be at least one Sabbath to the next. So this would be at least two, eight days. As it would be less than a month. They would use a different phrase, but this is an idiom that means more than a Sabbath. Okay, so so he's 
Paul stays with them several days. That's good use of their time because remember they caught that cargo ship instead of taking the pilgrim ship. They chain ship itself 300 miles at one time. So now they have these days, these weeks, to spend with Philip. It's there in Caesarea. And my, how he had to have forgiven Paul. Paul had killed his friend Stephen. and been the chief testifier, the one that uh, they laid with their garments at Saul's feet while they stoned the man of God Stephen to death. And it's almost like the Savior said, Father, do not lay this sin to their charge. I, know, I just think that's such a powerful Stephen could do that. So Philip is, is the evangelist. He's been there for over 20 years now, preaching the word. And he has these four dollars. By the way, the Greek says the four dollars the way that it means they were under 16 years old. Uh, some say under 18. So Paul, now, I don't know if they were quadruple or not. That would that really be that would be a tough service to be in. Four kids wouldn't exactly like a crop of sign to you. But uh, but they uh, but he's got these four dollars, I don't know. 12, 14, 16, 18 years old. I don't know what their little age span was, but they would not be little children. That's also true. So they would be at least 12 and no older than 18. So it has these four dollars. And they prophesy. You know what I think? How blessed Philip was. He had his children after he arrived in Caesarea, he and his wife. And they are, they are just true to God. I want our children your grandchildren to be that. <coughs> I want our children to be that pure. To, to, to be an example. To, to do something that's right. And you never can tell who will be an example. I, I, I was, Ron, you and Johnny, if nobody else likes this story, you two will like this story. I was getting my tires put on. I said tires put on for dead. Monday. Now, see one of the boys is really a good boy. He graduated high school last year. I mean, this year, just a few months ago. That's the I said, where are you going to go? If this school is going to Marshall. And he's going to go into pharmacy. And I saw one of the little boys from our church. I said, well, the boy is like 28 years old. But he, 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 he from McDowell County, he said, oh, I've already heard about him. Because, see, you know, when Marshall University gets these kids down there, and they want to tell them about kids from McDowell County and Mingo County, you can do this, son. You can get your doctor. You can, you can do this because David Butler did. You can do this because Trey Lockhart did this. And, he said, you know him? I said, I know him. I baptized him, you know. What are you talking about knowing, you know? So, so yeah, so, guys, you never can tell how you win an example to somebody. Somebody, some, I guarantee you this. We are living epistles. And people are watching our lives right now. So Paul's this example, you know. So Philip's daughters, are they're just wonderful. And so, uh, so, so the, they have this gift of prophecy. And uh, I said, God bless us all that. Agnes the prophet. As I said, the only prophet that's mentioned in the New Testament. No, there were many. See, all the book of Acts doesn't just follow Paul. And, and Peter, it, it doesn't follow uh, Matthias or, or James uh, the less, or it doesn't follow John. And, and all those other, their men are spreading across the Roman Empire. The Tyran and Iraq and Egypt spreading the word of God. And so there are these prophets that God has put in the churches and apostles that are preaching the word of God. New revelation. By the way, there are nobody getting new revelation today. If you, I believe in the gift of prophecy, but it's not to add to this word. That would be God speaking to someone's heart about something. There are, nobody, there are no prophets adding to the word of God today. Amen? Amen. This book is finished. This book is God's word. We don't have anything added to this. There, there's nothing to add to. But Agabus is one of these men. He's fixed in special revelation from God. And his prophecy is not mixed. He's a seasoned prophet. He doesn't say, Paul, don't go. Don't go. He could have, by the way. If anybody would have had the authority, because he's not equal standing with Paul. He's one of the foundational men like the Apostle Paul is. If he had said, Paul, I really don't think you should go, he and Paul would have had to have I'm the priest. Say, Paul, are you sure the Holy Ghost is telling you to go? But Agabus already knows Paul has to go. Paul, I, here's what's going to happen to you, Paul, but you know as well as I do, Paul, you've got to go. This is what is going to happen. Not mine what happened. This is what happened to you. This is God's word. So so, so I, I love this guy. He's a, he's a very powerful man of God. Luke and Timothy and 
all the other pastors with them, everybody, even I, even Phil's daughters, I can hear them all. Please don't go, Paul. Please don't go. We all besought him. Verse 12, do not go up to Jerusalem. Don't do not go up to Jerusalem. But verse 13 to 14, then Paul answered, what mean you to weep? Paul is moved by these people. You think Paul a statue or something? He's moved by these. He loves Timothy. He loves uh, Timotheus. He loves these men. These are these are, are men of God. These are Billy Grahams. These, these are men of God that that that, that are starting these churches in, in, in faraway lands of, of Ephesus and, and, and Corinth. And they're, they're, these are great men of God. And Paul says, "You're breaking my heart, for I'm ready." Preach on that all day. I'm not going to go like that. But you could preach on that all day, couldn't you? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Now there's a good lesson. If you haven't been getting any lessons so far, I'm going to call this lesson number one. We should always be ready without hesitation, without reservation, to do what God tells you to do. Amen? Amen. I don't know what it is. I know what God tells you to do. I know certain things. God tells us all to read the Bible. God tells us all to live right. God tells us all to pray. I mean, God tells us all not to take a sin with ourselves. There's certain things, but I don't know what God is directing in your life. But I know this. It's a good lesson from Paul that we should be, without hesitation, what God wants us to be. I'm ready, he says. I'm ready. I'm ready. Not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem. Not for his name's sake. For the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, <laughs> Luke said, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. And there's another. We could go to the book of James right now and talk about the will of the Lord being done. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, you know. But we're not going to do that. But I'd like to, by the way. I wrote that down in chapter. I'm not going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. I'd like to go there and tell you about people that had faith. That, 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 that was what God wanted them to be. That didn't back down when they were sawed into sunder, when, when they were put and sawed in half, when, when they were thrown into fire. When the, the book of Hebrews says all these things happened. None of these men were moved. They did what God, and not just men, but also just women there. None of these people were moved by faith. They followed God. That's encouraging to us, God. That's how the fire or something just cranked up a little bit, you know. So I'm not, and when we could not persuade him, we said the Lord will be done. So I'm going to read you this right here because here's what Paul said. Paul had already written, written this. In fact, about four months before this, Paul wrote this. Okay, here's what Paul wrote. Just a few months before, he's standing there in Philip's house. They said we couldn't persuade him. Here's what Paul said. For we know, I'm reading from Romans chapter 8. Paul just wrote this a few months ago. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Y'all can quote this verse, can't you? Want to say, you know, I'm book marks and it's just a great, it's a great verse. Now, nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors, verse 37, through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. You want to know what Paul was persuaded about? They could persuade him to do that. You know what Paul was persuaded about? He thought, well, I'm getting ready now. Y'all calm down. It's like a Baptist get up and shout, all right? So y'all get ready. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, or principalities, or powers, or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Nothing. You want to know what Paul was persuaded about? That nothing can separate him from God. You know what we should be persuaded about? When we follow, nothing can separate us from God. Let's stick the course. Let's do what God's called us to do. All right, next part here. They go on to Jerusalem. And after those days, we took up our carriages. That's a good old King James word, carriages. It means luggage. They didn't have carriages. They didn't have more strong carriages. They were around in those days, but this is just a word for luggage. We took up our luggage. And went up to Jerusalem. That's going to be three to four day hard day traveling. But now they're in hurry. They spent some time. And then get to Pentecost. There went with us certain of the disciples of Caesarea. So everything, Paul's 
Paul's courage was courageous. Now, I know they're going to go to Pentecost anyhow. These, these, these Jewish Christians were from Caesarea. But now they're all willing to go with Paul. He's even going to die there. And brought with them, the King James says, but that's really not a good translation. It should say, and brought them to one mason of Cyprus, an old disciple, an old disciple with whom we lodged. With whom we lodged. And we're going up and when we get there, uh, Mason's going to take this whole big group of people, 20, 30 people, whatever it is, that's traveling with all the group of keep growing. But Mason's going to take us in. It says he's an old disciple. God, it doesn't mean he's an uh, old disciple. Broke down in my hips, you know. I, no, it made, it's the word early. He was early disciple. All right, he had been there. He knew Jesus. He had been there. I don't know if he was there on the day of Pentecost, but probably he was. He had the house in Jerusalem. He would have been there for Pentecost. He was a believer. He'd been a disciple even before that. He's an early guy. He stuck out all these years. All these years, he's another guy that's a good example for us. Mason, a disciple, an old disciple, learned disciple that had been there from the beginning. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. I like that. There's a large meeting. We'll, we'll see. Let me go down to verse 20. It says, uh, Thou seest, brother, it means you see with your own eyes. How many thousands, I don't know why the King James did that, it's the word mirror, it means tens of thousands. You see how many tens of thousands of Jews there which are believed. So, so the Paul on, on verse 17, there's this great big group of believers that have come together. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and then they were able to give these thousands of dollars to, to them, hundred thousand, tens of thousands, whatever dollars, uh, I say dollars, I don't know, they would give, they give uh, money to them. And, uh, and the day following, Paul went in with us. Here, uh, he is so pleased that he's part of the us today. Unto James. They heard about James. Everybody heard about James. Even though there were the apostles there, James was the leader of the church and had been for almost from the very beginning. Over 25 years ago, Paul was saved. James is the leader of the church. James the brother of Jesus. He's already written that it's very likely that Tropius and, and Tychus and, and, uh, and Gaius and all these men that are with Paul had read the book of James. It's very likely because it had been in circulation for over 10 years and many copies were out there. And all the elders were present. So I mean, this is a thrill. They were glad to receive this large crowd, good fellowship. And then the Gentile pastors and Luke, they meet James. They meet James. No doubt that heard Paul talk about James. Wait till you meet this man of God, James. He was the brother of Jesus Christ. That the same mama. Your daddy's <laughs> same mama. They were brought into the same bed. You do know that Joseph and Mary's house would be like everybody else's house in Galilee. Yeah, Galilee. Up in Nashville. So it would have been a... Uh, one big room and then one small room, and the parents would sleep in the smaller room, and everybody else slept. And then there talks about all these brothers, listen by me, five brothers, and at least sisters, so there's at least two sisters. It might have been more than it says sisters, so we don't know how many. So we say at least seven. Jesus makes eight. That's a lot of people in one little room, man. You get to know people pretty good, guys. You get to know people pretty good. I was so lucky. I was the only male in there. I have my own bed with my three sisters. First of all, they started out sleeping in the same bed. They said, we have no two beds. We was four. Finally, they got two beds. So two of them slept in one bed, one slept in one. But you didn't know. James knew Jesus. How exciting was it for them to look? I think I bet they had a thousand questions. James, tell us about Jesus. James, we've been waiting. One of the very exciting things that Paul said we were bringing this off in. We were forward. Glad you're here today. I'm glad you're here for Pentecost, James. James and the elders are seeing. Now, elders, if you've got tens of thousands of members, I'm just 
Thank you. Five, six hundred elders. Lots of elders will be taking care of. The elders will be the pastors. The Jerusalem pastors. Lots of elders taking care of this large church. And so uh, there they are. And uh, remember, James has said, if anybody is, is afflicted, let them call for the elders of the church and call them before we can still do that. But our church has been years ago. Still do this. James has also said this if any man lacks wisdom, let him walk. I love this. So they glorify God. And the following day, when Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present, and when we had saluted them, we declared with particularity, or, uh, particularly, that it's, a, it's a Greek word that means every detail. So Paul went on one of those long five-hour preaching sermons. He starts telling them, let me tell you what happened to Corinth. And oh, by the way, here's one pastor. Tell you what happened at, at Thessalonica. Here's one down there to the Tachyus with them, you know. Uh, let me tell you what happened at Ephesus. Thermopolis is there. I mean, he just, God, let me tell you what happened at Lystra. And there's Timothy standing there. All these things going on. So it goes that thousands of Jewish, thousands of Gentiles and Jews have been saved throughout all the, the Mediterranean Sea, the Roman Empire. What things God hath wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. That ain't even the end of the verse. <laughs> it's going to take a weird turn. I mean, but I can't explain it, so don't leave you. You can ask me after church if you want to, but all I know about it, I'm going to tell you right now, okay? I'll tell you some people that might be able to help you, but, but uh, this it's about to turn pretty weird, okay? So he tells them all the details. They glorify God. They praise God. They have this worship service. Oh, Paul, tell us more about this. Tell us more about this. They just worship the Lord. Then things take a little turn for the weird. Thou seest, brother, how many thousands, tens of thousands, the word is myriads, how many myriads of Jews there are which believe, and they're all, I don't really know if James is just using hyperbole here, I don't know if all of them will be, but the most part of these men are zealous of the law. In James's opinion, all of them are. They're zealous still to keep the law. Now, here's a question. Should they be keeping the law? Now that they're believers, they have no reason to still be thinking blood sacrifices did and Jesus was paid off. What? Now you say, why did God allow this? Well, in about eight to ten years from this day, they're standing there this day, about eight or ten years from now, Jerusalem's going to be torn to the ground. The temple's going to be destroyed. And, and from 870, because this is probably about 862, from 870, there's been no sacrificial system in Jerusalem. There, there are no, there's no priesthood. Uh, there's no temple. By the way, it'll be revealed. We know that for a fact. And uh, the Antichrist will have a part in it. That's just because something good happened doesn't mean it's a good of God, you see. But then don't forget in the book of Ezekiel, that temple will also be destroyed. And then Jesus Christ himself will build the temple of God for the new kingdom. But all this is about to come to an end. All this is about to end on them right here, guys. But right now, uh, these Jewish people are saved. They've accepted Jesus as the Messiah. But they're having a hard time letting go of the traditions. Now remember, Paul's already in the book of Galatians. And Paul says circumcision is nothing. Our own circumcision is nothing. We're, we're all one family in God. The law cannot save you. The law was a schoolmaster. He's already written all this stuff. This book of Galatians has already been written. And they are informed of you that you teach all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses. That's a straight out, that's a bold faced lie. That's a lie. That's not true at all. Paul had not told them to forsake Moses. Paul's not saying this at all. This is a lie. You, you are out preaching to the people, to the Jews, that they should apostatize. That's the, that's the Greek word that you there, apostasy, apostasize. Uh, you're to apostatize Moses. Moses. Paul preached Moses. Paul loved Moses. Paul preached the word of God. 
Stephen, when you read his message, he preaches it forward, talks mostly about what God was doing in the wilderness with Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it there for? Well, this is James, the big dog, talking to the other big dog, Paul, and all these pastors, elders, the Gentile pastors, the Jewish pastors, are all listening. The multitudes must need to come together. We need to get everybody on the same page. Now, you've already met with several thousand, because you've already seen with your own eyes, because see us mean you saw with your own eyes back in verse 20. There's thousands, tens of thousands, of, and, 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 and they would hear the dark come, because word's going to spread that that apostle Paul's come, the one that's teaching against the law. Now, it's a lie, guys. It's a lie. It's perjury. So, all right, let's stop here for a second. The, the, enemy, the enemy lies. Satan is a father of lies. He's a father of liars. The book of Revelation says that in the lake of fire there will be murderers, witchcraft, fornicators, and all liars have their place in the lake of fire. So lie, you mean lying is as bad as murder? You mean lying is as bad as adultery? I said this before and I can't keep this smiling hard when I say it, but there would never be any adultery people. Some of y'all should say amen on that. I'm not saying you can't be a doctor, but I'm saying nobody would ever steal if you couldn't lie. What if, all right, stand before the judge. Did you steal that new car? Yes, sir, I did. I'll tell you how I did. And people lie. Lie is the seven things God hates, and lie is just the twice. You believe that? Seven things God hates. God hates lies and God calls you. Because Satan is the father of liars. They're, they're lying about Paul. He never told people not to be circumcised. He said, if you're circumcised, okay. If you're, if you're not circumcised, you don't have to be. But remember, he even took Timothy, which was a grown man because his mama was a Jew, which made him Jewish. And he had never been circumcised because his dad was a Greek. And he took and he personally circumcised Timothy. But then Titus, he was not allowed to be circumcised because he was a Gentile. So he said, Paul's getting very clear on this. He's not saying, he just said, if you're circumcised, it's all right. If you're not circumcised, Paul had had a vow. Just a few chapters ago, back in chapter 18. Remember, he shaved his head. Paul, it's a very difficult thing to let go of the law. But Paul wasn't keeping any part of the law, Paul. He, you remember that Peter ate with Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. Down in Galatia. But Peter ate with Gentiles. Until some of the people from James came down and then even Peter. So Paul, and I said, brave man. Paul said, I stood against Peter face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and I said, you are a sinner. Wow. The last person that stood in front of Peter face to face, not ready to speak. Peter's a man of God. But Paul is also. Paul said, I'm not going to let Peter slide either. You can't act one way one time and one way another. But Paul had not taught, do not keep the law. What he taught was that the law could not save you. And James knows that. But so I, it's really weird. I wish I could explain why James does this more. But Paul was trying to keep the peace. Therefore, do therefore this, we say unto thee. We have four men, Christian brothers, which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them. That would mean go through the ceremonial cleansing and be at charges with them. And, she, and that they may shave their heads, and all may know uh, uh, that, uh, that those things, there are which are informed concerning thee are not. But thou thyself walk up er orderly. He does. Keep us the law. He did not. James, you're wrong. Paul does not keep the law. And I know James is wanting to keep peace in the church. And so Paul is wanting to keep peace too. So he, he actually does this because he would be pure by himself. He actually, as we'll read in the next in, uh, verse 26, he actually pays for all this. So he'll be paying for uh, five lambs to be slain. That's pretty expensive. He'll be paying for ten turtle doves to be slain. He'll be paying for all of this out of his own pocket. That's not the offering that came up. He's paying for this himself. And you be cleansed. But Paul wants us to keep the peace. So here's a lesson for us. Here's a lesson I can take from you. Paul said, I'll do this if it'll help me reach the Jews for Jesus. Paul says, I'll do this 
if it'll help me reach the Jewish Christians and be able to teach them. Did not Paul already write and say, I will be all things to all men? I'll be a Jew to the Jews. No, he never did Christian. They never hid what he did. But he, he certainly wouldn't purposely try to go into a Jewish home, carry a pork chop away. Now, that'd be silly. You're not going to witness anybody that way. You know, you can't do that. So, so, he, so, he, so, he, so it's just that it's a very hard part of the scripture to understand. But Paul wants to keep the peace. He wants to be purified. And as touching the Gentiles, which we which believe, we have written. So this would have been back in chapter 15, years ago, 20-some years ago. We've already concluded that they observe no such thing. They don't have to be circumcised. Say that they keep themselves from things offered to idols. Makes sense. And from blood and from things strangled. Uh, that would be things would be openly non-kosher. Uh, because it would have been the Jewish brethren. They said because Moses preached everywhere. Back in chapter 15. And for fornication. They can't commit adultery and stuff and act like they're going to heaven. Verse 26. Then Paul took the men the next day, purifying himself with them, and into the temple. So he'd stay there in the temple. He and these four men for the next week. They would have to stay in the room. They'd be allowed out of the temple area. To signify the accomplishments of their purification. Until that an offering should be made, Luke makes this clear, for every one of these, this is an important detail, Luke adds this, every Paul's going to take care of everybody that expenses. What Paul wants to do is try to keep the peace so he can explain to them so that they understand. Of course, they know that keeping the law doesn't save them. And guys, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I was not brought up in another religion. I imagine if you were, it would be very difficult. No, not this, I'm not saying you should. No, that's why this is. If, if you're if you're sinning, if your religion has sin, that you can't keep sinning. But I imagine I did hear about a Jewish brother that got saved. This is not even this was in the United States just not long ago. And he said he could not feel like he's praying unless he did this. Because if you go to Jerusalem, that's how. Or if you're in a Jewish synagogue in America, that's how they pray. They get in place, back and forth like that. So he said, I don't feel like I'm praying. Well, there's nothing wrong with doing that when you pray. Might confuse a lot of people, but it, uh, it didn't bother. I mean, so you can see why things are, it's just very confusing. So, so Paul does this. Now we have some direct proof. That's getting worse. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, remember Asia was where that big rock was at in, in Ephesus. And then and they kept going on. Uh, the, the Jews and the hated him, but also the, the worshippers of Diana hated him. Stirred up all the people, they laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people. So, number one, he teaches against the people. He, number two, he teaches against the law. He teaches against this holy place. And further, brought Greeks into the temple and have polluted this holy did that. That's a lie, a bold-faced lie. For they had seen before with him in the city Thermopheus, Thermopheus and Ephesians. Now, and they were from us. They were from Asia. So they knew, they knew. That seems, oh, that's that guy, that creature there. That's that Greek creature. And we know Paul brought him here. We came with Paul. Whom they supposed, supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. It's, a, it's a, just a complete lie. This is not true. Paul would not do that. Now, you understand. Let me explain. Look up this way. Let me explain this to you. The Jewish temple, if you remember, Solomon's temple, and then Herod's temple after the Greek built, had a court of the Gentiles. That's where Jesus twice overturned the money tables because that was supposed to be the place where Gentiles could come and Jewish men would teach them about, about Jehovah, how to, to live right, how to, how to offer sacrifice, how to be the only true and living God. But what they had done, they set up a marketplace there. And Jesus said, you turn my father's house into the thieves. thieves. Yes. But then when you got past that, the court of the Gentiles, there was this little wall, not little, it was about four foot high, four foot high or so. 
And it had this sign. I'm not going to read you the whole sign, but this is, it was written in two languages. It was written in Greek and in Latin. They had to write the Hebrew because it was for the Jews. For the Jews. It says, No foreigner may enter into this wall. If any man does, he will have only himself to blame for his ensuing death. Wow. They're saying, Paul is not going to, why would Paul do that? That's what he would But when you get a religious crowd stirred up, I don't care what, even in the Ephesus, they scream for hours, great as Diana. They did. Some come from one part, some for another. Remember, so we said that's a bad business. Thing. Some would come from one reason, some would come from another. But for the most part, they didn't know why they gathered together. And Paul says, hey, this is a mess. You look on the loop, so this is a mess. And all these people screaming and carrying on. But what does Paul say about Paul's in a, in a few months? after this, Paul's going to write this. This hasn't been written yet. But in a few months, Paul's going to write this. While he, he's taken into prison in the, in, the, in the next three verses, and he's not going to be out of prison until the book of Acts is going to do everything else in the book of Acts Paul is in prison. One prison or another. As the Romans pass him along the way. Okay? Here's what Paul says. As he's in Caesarea, back to where Philip is at. That's the first prison they take him to after he leaves Jerusalem. So it's two years there at, uh, in uh, Caesarea. And you're right, sister, right here. To the Ephesians. I love it. Because it's the Ephesian Jews that stirred up the trouble, but they're not Christians. So here's what Paul writes to the Ephesian Christians. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. We don't need a peace offering. So that's what Paul was going to pay for, for these five peace offerings. Because it ended their battle. For he is our peace, who have made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. They may still have a wall up in Jerusalem, but God don't have a wall anymore. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Verse 18. For, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the we already read this. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophet, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Paul says <coughs> there's not any separation anymore. God don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. He doesn't care if you're rich or poor. He doesn't care if you're, if you're white or Asian or black or Spanish. All of us, Jesus died and shed his own blood to save our social Amen. Amen. And that's why prejudice is such a horrible thing. I hope that No hint of that. Everyone who come to this church is welcome. If they're unsaved, they're welcome as an unsaved person, regardless if they're white, Asian, black, whoever they are. If they come as a believer, we welcome as a believer, regardless of the color of their skin, because we're all involved by the same blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So, so the heading there. Then now we come to our last point this morning. Okay. And, uh, this is this will go really fast. Okay. But but this kind of uh, just tells you everything that's been prophesied for the last several weeks come true. And all the city was moved and the people ran together trying to get into the temple, even more people. And they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, that is, out of out into the court of the Gentiles. And forthwith the doors were shut. They didn't shut the doors. The Roman soldiers shut the doors so no more people can get in and cause more of a mess. And they, so part of the soldiers did that. They're on high alert on all the Jewish feasts. And as they went about to kill him, Titans came to the chief captain of the band. So some of the soldiers locked the door so no more Jews can get in to the temple. They drug Paul out into the court of the Gentiles so they could have a bigger crowd to be. Some of them run up into the Antonio fortress and get Get the chief captain, we later on find out his name is Claudius, chapter 23. He's a really good man. In fact, every centurion we ever read about in the Bible is a good man. But two of them just say, and he's not a centurion. He's called, the Greek word here was just chief captain of Chiliarch. It means he is a, uh, Chilius. Ch Chiliar means 1,000. He's, he's over 1,000 men. He's over 10 centurions. So he's the, he's the God that's been sent by Rome to keep the peace in Jerusalem because those Jews love to start up trouble when you get Jerusalem goes from about 200,000 to about a million and a half, two million during the feast days. So Rome always sends lots of soldiers there to keep the peace. 
So they go get this, get Claudius, the main guy. All Jerusalem was in an uproar. So immediately took soldiers and centurions, plural. So, so he's got at least 200 soldiers worth of mountain. How many centurions would be the most trained of men? We've met some of them. Jesus will centurion. Uh, he'll kill his servant. He becomes a believer. Uh, uh, Peter goes and preaches at a Gentile's house, this uh, centurion. And he becomes a believer, okay? And ran down to them. They're in a hurry. They're getting there in a hurry. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, you see about 200 armed men come at you with swords drawn. You back off for it, don't you? So all these Jews left beating upon them. But can I take a time out here and just being a little bit because I'm upset? Where's James? Where's all these Christian brothers? Where's all the people that said, Paul will go with you to the very end? Should one of them jump up and say, I'm with him. If you're going to beat him, you're going to beat me. I'm a little bit aggravated. They make my business. That's God's business because they don't work for me. They work for God. But where are they at, guys? Why is somebody jumping up? You, you, you sent Paul into this mess to go to do this. Why aren't some of you Christian elders, you hundreds of elders there? Why aren't you there saying, hey, this is not my man. You can't beat him like that. You can't do that. You know what? Because not everybody has the courage of conviction. It's easy to have the courage of conviction sitting in a Baptist church on a Sunday morning. What do you do when the boss is cussed you on a Tuesday? Are you going to stand up for God? Or are you going to let your temper get the best of it? I'm going to try to be honest, guys. What am I going to do? Where am I going to stand? I mean, you know, you better make up your mind now. Paul been preparing himself for months. Nothing's going to do. But you know, nobody stands with him. That's just very accurate. Nobody stands with him. And the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. Man, it's a dangerous preacher. You'll find out in a minute why we use two chains. And demanded that he, uh, who he was and what he'd done. And here, sounds just like the Gentile uh, false idol worshippers there. Now. And some cried one thing and some another. Among the multitude. But he would not know the certainty for the torment because there's the, a the, the racket going on. He commanded him to be carried into the castle until they had come to the fortress. Now, so, I say this be careful that if there's a group of Christians together or if there's just two or three Christians, be a Christian. Don't get caught up in this mob mentality. We're so used to being the underdog. What if there's a whole group of Christians? I'll be honest, guys. I know how human nature is inside of us. So these, these Jews act no different. And they should have been different because they were God's chosen people. And, uh, and many of them already are believers. I don't know the believers participated in the beating of him. And when he would have come, and when he came up the stairs, so it was, that he was born of the soldiers. I don't know if he was beaten that badly or they just carried him because of security. Or the violence, so evidently because of the beating. Maybe we just try to get him out of the Bible so the people. For the multitude of the people followed after saying, somebody read that. Away with him. Away with him. Does that sound familiar? Did that sound familiar to Paul, who was a member of the Sanhedrin? For about 30 years ago? 27 years ago? I stood there in Jerusalem. I looked at a man named Jesus, Yeshua. There while they stoned Stephen. Paul was a believer, but then remember Paul was stoned to death by Lister. God had to raise him from the dead and they throw him under the town garbage. You know. Be careful what you do because even though God has forgiven you of your sins, you're not going to be responsible for your sins. Your actions still have consequences. You can't be like this guy that I know Gilbert that comes and said, You would not believe how many Christians come to me and say, Now that I'm a Christian, I still have to pay my debt to you. They owe you money. Maybe it's been 10 years. I've carried you on these books for your bedroom suit for 10 years. I probably ought to probably come and pay me now until you got saved. You know? So Paul is, is, is giving to sounds so much like the Savior, all this stuff going on. And uh, 
All is bound. Treat like Jesus. Now we have a little preaching. So this, verse 37 through verse 40 is actually, I'm not going to reread it next week, but this is a commercial for uh, every, almost every show I week is set ever next week's episode. It's always got that good voice for everyone. So this is next week's episode, Paul's preaching. So here's a little preview for the next chapter. And when Paul was led into the castle, he said to the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? And who said the chief captain, can you speak Greek? Who is this cat? He's an educated man. You, later on, Paul's going to tell him that the Roman citizen, Claudius is going to say, I paid a fortune for my Roman citizenship. Just because you're a Roman soldier didn't mean you're a Roman citizen. I paid a fortune. And Paul says, friend, I was born free. My family has been free. We've been citizens for generations. And God has long Say that, but he's very interested. He saves Paul's life more than once. He's very interested in this. Can you speak Greek? Are you not that Egyptian which before these days made an uproar and lead us down into the wilderness? 4,000 men that were murderers? That explains why they put him in two chains, doesn't it? They thought he was a wanted man from Egypt. They thought he was a dangerous man, had 4,000 armed soldiers with him. Paul said, I'm not an Egyptian. Paul said, I'm a man of a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Sicily, a citizen of no, me means insignificant. I'm, I'm a city of no instant, a member of a citizen of no insignificant city. That's been so Tarsus would know about, uh, about Tarsus, the capital city of Sicily. I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Wow. The word speak there is the word that's translated to preach six times. He says to him in Greek, you know, let me speak. But six times when Paul says I speak, he really means preach, okay? And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs, so he's able to use composure, stand up, and beckoned with his hand to calm the people down. I guess when you, when you got 200 soldiers and you've got Claudius standing there with you, finally the people make a great silence. Now you and I know it's because God was doing this. God calmed the people. Speak to them in the Hebrew tongue. Wow. Now that's what we'll start out with. Jesus carried his coming next week. We'll start out. What did he say to them? What did he say to them? Well, don't wait for me to tell you. Read this next week. Don't read this before. Read this before you go to bed this evening. What did Paul say to them? So this is about this. Okay, so be courageous. Here's our last slide. Be courageous. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies in you. Expect your enemy to lie. He's the father of lies. And remember this, no matter what happens, you have a victory in Jesus Christ. Amen. You will please stand with us and open your hymn. Hymn books to page 366. Page 366. As we stand together this morning. Think about the courage of conviction. Do you have the courage to stand by your conviction for Jesus? So sing together.
between 